Good afternoon, Alex. How are you? Yeah, I'm good, thanks, Jamie. Yeah, good. How are you? Yeah, very good, very good. Well, th thank you so much for making the time to join this series of sentientist conversations. We've talked briefly before. We focus on asking, I guess, two of the most deep and I think most important philosophical questions, what's real and what matters morally. Um, and I have a clear bias. It's in the name of this podcast and YouTube and that it's based around trying to popularise this um, simple idea called sentientism, which commits to using evidence and reason when thinking about what to believe and how to believe. And uh, when it comes to what matters, again, the clue is in the name, we should think about sentience, the capacity to have experiences, to suffer, to flourish as the only thing really required to warrant moral consideration. But I'm talking to people in these conversations who agree and disagree with that philosophy. So it'll be fascinating to understand your own journey, where you've got to now and the implications for the future. Um, but before we get onto those crazily big questions, how would you best introduce yourself and your work for people who don't know you? Uh, I'm uh, I'm a writer, academic activist, I guess, with a couple of hyphens or dashes, yeah. um, uh, and and probably in that order now. Um, and it sometimes changes, but yeah, writer, academic, activist. Um, in that, uh, most of what I do uh, is practiced around storytelling, narrative, creativity, uh, in trying to use the that skill set to help serve the planet. Um, make uh, our living conditions in this society and the generations to come uh, better suited for flourishing. Um, I'm lucky enough to be based within uh, an academic practice at the University of Sunderland, uh, where I teach creative writing um, and, and all forms of professional writing. And that gives me a great deal of scope to explore uh, the themes and issues that I want to. Um, and I uh, ground a lot of the sort of practical work that I do within activist communities. So I was one of the founding core team of Animal Rebellion, uh, responsible particularly for media, but also for narrative and narrative strategy. So, you know, what are our asks? You know, what are the messages that are going to cut through? And I've also been the director of the SAVE movement in the UK. Um, I'm a member of the Vegan Society's Research Advisory Committee. And I've just written a major report for the Vegan Society on the policy we need for a plant-based food system. Uh, and in a way, not as a food policy expert, but as a synthesizer, a, a writer who can bring all of those ideas together and help them land in a way that can be palatable um, and puts uh, the vegan and um, plant-based and activist community on the front footing when we have these conversations. Yeah, fascinating. Well, it sounds like you're doing about 19 different jobs. So, uh. <laughs> yeah, you know what? It's it's one of the things, isn't it? About um, uh, it's it's it getting better at saying no to things because the difficult the difficult discussions in life are always between the good thing you want to do and the good thing you want to do. It's never between the good and bad, is it? So, uh, I I have actually been through um, a bit of a process recently and just making sure that I'm only doing the things that I really uh, the big things that I that I can contribute to rather than dissipating too much energy yeah well i'm glad you accepted my invitation before you started that that no call. no this is this is <laughs> no, absolutely one of those things actually sharing uh sharing ideas um but you know like i've actually got a model as a writer i don't know if this is useful for people who are listening but i've got a model for a writer that whatever project you're working on there's four or five elements of it and, and one being the private writing that you have to do but one being public writing as well you know like actually you know making sure that these messages go out so uh, we, you know we've had the conversation before that i was at cop 26 and actually some public writing came out of that because it was urgent and it felt necessary and it felt the right thing to do and one of those and one of the other things is making sure that you're you're part of a network um so these kinds of conversations are informing what i'm writing so i'm i'm here as a as a guest to collaborate with you but i'm also here as a learner to to have this conversation and see where my my thoughts and 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 thinking can develop through the conversation yeah magic well, i mean that's partly why i call these conversations because it gives me excuse to rant on a little bit as well rather than it just being an interview but yeah no i'm i'm sure i've got more to learn from you than the other way around but let's see how the conversation goes um and and i'm interested in you know we'll come back to this in the final question about how do we make a better future this centrality of narrative and the importance of narrative because one of my previous guests suggested maybe that's a challenge with this sort of sentientist worldview is that maybe it feels a bit too sort of cold and clinical and analytical you know maybe there isn't you know it doesn't really have a narrative that goes with it but so it might be interesting to explore that later on because i think we can layer some quite powerful stories around it but let's see yeah absolutely yeah no absolutely let's let's discuss
So the first of those crazily broad questions, what's real? Um, for many of my guests, it's a story about whether they grew up originally in maybe a more religious, a supernatural, a spiritually minded household and society, or one that was more naturalistic and scientifically minded, maybe atheist, agnostic, and how that side of their philosophy shifted over time as we work out in this uh, amazing universe we share, you know, what to believe and how to believe. So you can wind the clock back as far as you like. It would be interesting to know your story on the sort of epistemology, if you like. Yeah, sure. Well, interestingly, I'll, I'll just, to begin with, I'll just wind it back a week uh, because I've, yeah, I've, I've just returned. I mean, it's perfect timing, really, because I've just returned from a uh, week-long retreat in Spain, which was a shamanic journeying uh, ayahuasca retreat in terms of in engaging with um, sort of questions of our spiritual place in the universe, um, how our bodies are the um, uh, receptacles and vehicles for our spiritual uh, embodied journeys. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, asking deep questions about what it means to be sort of a, a human being in this planet. Uh, and I, I came to wanting to have this experience uh, for many personal reasons um, to do with sort of uh, finding better, better ways to live. But also actually what, what it's turned out, to, it's, it's actually been incredibly useful and was building up in this, it, um, as part of the reason for it, having this exploration was about um, grounding uh, my own creative work and my philosoph philosophical work and, and, and activist practice within more animist ontologies and, and methodologies. You know, really, uh, you know, if we believe uh, as, a, as an activist for animals, as an advocate for the non-human world, uh, for the importance of the embodied encounter between the human and the non-human, uh, to reground uh, both sides of that divide and i'm doing you know square quotes you know in terms of around the word divide um uh, grounding both sides uh, in the um embodied encounter it was really important for me to ask questions about well who 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 is a person you know who, who are who who is a person uh, and can we co-create this planet that recognizes the uh, birthright of both um, of all beings on this planet, not just humans. And, and that is very, very different from a very a long way away from my understood or remembered upbringing. You know, so I came, I come from a working class in a city, London background, grew up in, um, on, in council estates in, uh, in South London, uh, from, um, grandparents who were in the army or worked in W who worked in, W. Smith or, or um, paramedics uh, or wheelwrights. Actually, my granddad was a wheelwright. Um, and uh, my dad was an engineer and my mother was a secretary. Um, and there was a religious uh, element to the upbringing that actually ended pretty soon after my parents were divorced. Um, and that was a Catholic upbringing. Uh, but actually, uh, my, my granddad was an atheist. My, my father was an atheist. Um, so reality for me uh, was... Uh, reality for me as a as a child and upbringing was very much grounded in school of hard knocks university of life uh, and spiritual and religious questions were they weren't they weren't very real actually even though we we attended you know we went to church every weekend uh but that ended around um you know a teenage years uh, after i was confirmed actually I was confirmed in the catholic faith but there was something for me that didn't sit right about the fact that my very, very kind and generous atheist grandfather was not going to go to heaven you know, because he didn't believe in the same religion. And so, uh, however, having said that, there are experiences um, uh, that, uh, that some would call spiritual, some would explain through quantum field theory of... Um, connecting with uh our planet uh with the broader universal spirit that we're in that, have, that has always been quite real to me and uh that i have i believe channeled into some set of skill around symbolic synthesis or symbolic interpretation so i am a I'm, you know like so for example i have a uh, I have a practice where I use tarot cards for journaling, um, not because I'm necessarily believing that there's any divination in them. 
um, but that actually uh, the deeper understandings of the way that myths and narratives and stories and images work within us and make sense for us is something that actually we've we disconnected from we've lost connection from and there and so like a, it was a natural path for me i think to want to engage further with animism uh, and animist practices uh which are through indigenous cultural beliefs and and, and practices such as using plant medicine from the Amazon to recognize a broader uh, church of beings in who are persons, you know? Yeah. Um, so, and, and just to, just to draw you back to the, I guess the Catholic starting point, it sounds like um, you, you may have believed at some point sort of by default, but it was never really central to your life. It wasn't that important. And you um, moved away from it quite easily um, because it wasn't central. And you moved away from it partly because of that sort of ethical challenge of, you know, it doesn't make sense for my grandfather to burn for hell and eternity just because he doesn't choose to believe. W were there any other f factors in there? Because for some of my guests, it is more about the ethics. Sometimes it's, it is, you know, the idea of hell being unjust, or it might be that they see, you know, sexism or homophobia or some other practices flow through the interpretation of the religion that they push back on. And for others, and for me, it was a bit more like this at first, it is more of sort of an evidence and a reason thing. You know, they read the Bible or the Quran and they see the inconsistencies and they learn about other religions and they think this sounds like it was probably made up by a guy a couple of thousand years ago more than. So it's, sometimes it's an evidence and reason thing. Sometimes it's a, you know, morality and ethics thing. Yeah, I think it came quite. Yeah, I think I think it came quite naturally for me to understand that it was a story. It was a symbolic story. Uh, I mean, I so I went to uh, religious Catholic school as you know, um, uh, at primary level and the secondary level. And at secondary level, my school was actually run by um, it was a it was an inner city London comprehensive. You know, it wasn't a private school or anything special, but it was run by um, the De La Salle Brotherhood. So my school was run by monks, uh, and religious um, religious education was a, a mandatory part of the education. Uh, and but it became it was very clear to me, and again think through both the behaviours of the monks, um, good and bad, um, and and I believe that the good behaviour was actually just as important as showing that religion was a story as well as the bad behaviour, um, but also the fact that we were studying it and we were being asked to look at it and explore it um, gave actually a really op gave a great opportunity to to explore it as the story as it was being taught to us. It was not taught to us. Uh, as a uh, fundamentalist truth, you know, it was taught to us as a a, a set of beliefs and experience that that some people have. And actually, then when you and then obviously when you compare that to the fact that there are other religions with other sets of experiences and beliefs that other people have, you understand that it's a choice. So marry that with actually a very strong, um, a very strong anti an antipathy for religion from my father, um, as well as the understanding that, you know, my, my questioning sense of both my grandfather and his cats were not going to heaven. <laughs> then, <laughs> then, you know, it all, it all, it all became very clear um, that it was, you know, very much that religion is storied, you know, religion is, is symbolic stories. Uh, and, and again, actually, and, and, and it, but it was very personal. It was very, you know, in terms of also my, my grandmother, uh, my mother's mother uh, was a was grew up in a she was Irish she was an Irish Catholic so very strong committed quite strict Catholic um, and then when my mother actually became pregnant at the age of seventeen she ran away from home scared because she was pregnant outside of wedlock uh, and gave birth on uh, gave birth to a daughter on Bromley South train station platform delivered by a policeman and. That was the last time she ever saw the baby because the baby was taken away because my grandmother, her mother, would not allow the baby back into the house because it was out of wedlock. It was a sin. And I never knew that growing up. I only learned that when I was about 19 or 20. But when I did learn it, it did, uh, it did make an awful, awful lot of sense to the family dynamic previously. But what, I, but what was clear to me growing up was that I did not agree with or like the family dynamic between my grandmother and my mother. And I and I re recognised a lot of that was around this the imposition of some form of external authority that that was not good for people, and I think that played in a lot to my um, rejection of established 
religious religions. Yeah. So in and terms I, and of, I think so, it, and I think it can. I mean, there's a few different. There's a lot of good that can flow through religious and supernatural worldviews. There's often compassion at their heart, but there are, you know, often a number of problems that can warp compassionate ethics. And I think that's a that's a really painful example of of one of the primary ones where something else is put as more important than the suffering and flourishing life and death of sentient beings, human or otherwise. Um, and and as soon as you put that, you know, whether it's the deity or the church or the rabbi or the institution or a one-party state or you know, any other sort of abstract concept as being overriding the importance of individual people, um, yeah, quite often bad things follow. So, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like you, you can't... Um... It's, it's some of the, you know, I don't know whether we'll get into it, but it's some of the criticisms that I know other people have had and also I've had of sort of like effective altruism as a, as in a way a, a surrogate replacement for, you know, for, for moral, uh, a, a moral compass, you know, in that, that, um, that uh, it, it doesn't often respect the, the very individual need in front of you. Um, you know, if it's more effective to help the 10 people over there than the one person in front of you, that's the right thing to do. And yet the one person in front of you is the one that you're connected to. Um, so yeah, it, it, I mean, it's a very, it's a very interesting question to reflect upon, you know, what is real for me and, and where did that reality, uh, where, where did the uh, ideas or de- decisions around what's real for me come from? But it, it, it very much was um, around ethics of care, I think, as more than ethics of morality. Um, and I would certainly position myself as being very much more aligned with the care ethicists, you know, the, the body of work and philosophies that have come out of, um, Carol, is it Carol Gilligan and Carol Adams and Joseph Donovan and, um, Josephine Donovan and, um, that talk about the individual flourishing, you know, rather, and they, and very much grounded in that before getting into the abstract questions of morality. But where it came from, it's really interesting to reflect upon. It came from individual relationships and ex- and seeing how um, ethical structures were absolutely blocking the flourishing of individuals. Yeah, you know, in in, yeah. in in interpersonal, interfamilial relationships. Yeah, so that can that can lead you into a skepticism about sort of formalized moralities because you can see it blocking. Yeah, absolutely, and that and I and I and I, and I would recognise that I do I do carry. I do carry that skepticism about um, uh, any of those formal, uh, rigid structures or definitions of ethics. Yeah, and we'll we'll come on to that and as we address the second question. Um, but I want to spend a little bit more time on this sort of what's real thing because the, the journey you've described is fascinating. Because I think you know many of my guests started with some sort of religious context. For some, it was absolutely central. For others, it was more background, and they moved away from that to, I guess, a sort of naturalistic default you know whether it's agnostic or atheistic it was just you know but i don't have a supernatural belief um and some like me have stayed there you know i'm fairly boring sort of classical straight down the line naturalistic um person i guess but quite a few people have either retained or refound some elements of that uh religious sense or transcendence of interconnectedness of uh, narratives and stories and you've talked through your sense of that and um i find that a fascinating evolution as well because there seem to be different flavors there so some people will move back into that space and quite comfortably accept a more spiritual supernatural transcendent possibility that they feel you know an intuitive or perceptual connection to other people will feel some of those same things and i think i feel some of those same things but still put it in quite a strictly naturalistic context so i can think about the interconnectedness of you know physics and biology and i can and evolution um and um so in a way there's still different flavors of having those similar sort of feelings of interconnectedness and meaning and awe and transcendence um have you got a sense of whether yours and there may not be a clear answer to this is still in a sort of naturalistic context or, or is it more, you know, maybe there are things beyond the natural world that you feel some sort of connection to? Yeah, I, like I would say, yes, definitely in the second camp, but I don't see it, I don't see it as in a way as beyond the naturalistic world. I mean, it's I understand what you're saying, you know, yeah, yeah, it's yeah. actually part of it. Like um, 
And actually, the uh, from my very limited understanding of quantum theory, uh, quantum physics, and quantum field theory, um, an awful lot of what um, people would explain as spiritual or, or inexplicable is actually is in there somewhere in quantum field theory. It's it's sort of it's um, possibly uh, the thing, yeah. yeah, possibly, yeah. But that's the point. You know, we're, we're not we we don't know. Um, and I've all. I think it's been a large part of my identity as a writer to um, to make connections between uh, ideas, theories, uh, sensibilities, experiences, um, and therefore I, in a way, I'm, you know, I'm uh, right-brained as much as possible in that way. Um, that the putting together of imagery symbols experiences into a narrative uh it's part it's it's part magic you know and i say that into you know you know it's it's part you know like the, the things that affect us the things that make us connect um they're not the the naturalistic scientific rationalistic ways of of seeing or proving except in the world very often they are the things that we don't that the, they're, they're the intuitive they're the symbolic they're the um emotive and i know all of that is grounded in our biological our, our chemistry the physics of who we are but it's still a little bit inexplicable and just out of the grasp of our um limited conscious experience of life so for me absolutely i i see a great deal of space um for in the end translating into practical application in the world to make the world a better place to flourish for um for grounding people's ex, ex, you know for for accepting and grounding pe um the possibilities of life in that broader uh in that broader um definition of uh, how we make sense of the world uh so what is real for me is definitely not always something that can be only explained by more naturalistic approaches and that doesn't mean at all that i'm a you know um a a believer in you know the the outright magical thinking or magical explanations but what's what's really interesting when you read you know people like you know um joan didion's book of you know the year of magical thinking you know which is talking about grief um and you put that together with the ways that actually people's bodies break down in grief you know a friend of mine uh her you know they they, they lost their she lost her brother her parents lost their son uh, in a motorbike accident and the father's leg just stopped working for six months do you know what i mean and it and the doctor went it's just grief it's just grief there is no other we don't have a a direct medical explanation for this but his leg isn't working because it's grief and the magical thinking um that happens uh is uh, around particularly things like grief or emotion emotive experience of life is not uh, is not and is not yet fully ever explained by a naturalistic scientific approach to the world yeah, I think there's a lot of value in that because I think the core of it for me is is a sense of humility uh, that you know we recognise that we're sort of evolved apes. Um, so with with limited perceptions, limited cognition, why should we think we will be able to understand the world perfectly? So we should have humility about that. And I think sometimes a sort of scientific world you can come across as dogmatic in its own right it's like overconfident we've done the spreadsheet we've done the analysis here's the answer but actually the core of a naturalistic approach should be humility it should be you know i'm always open to new evidence the evidence might change i need to be skeptical of my own reasoning i need to watch out for wishful thinking for my own biases we're never completely right we're always probabilistic and provisional in our thinking and and keep that humility and i think the the checks for me one is to recognize you know get comfortable saying i don't know um get comfortable saying we may never know but that's not an excuse for not trying to find out let's just keep pushing those boundaries but then to resist the temptation for you know wishful thinking or any other motivation for us to put credence in things where there isn't really evidence so i think there's a big difference for me between recognizing uncertainty and maybe fundamental uncertainty and you know, and sort of fabricating stuff just because we like the idea of it. Um, and I think the second check is um, just to watch out for where 
those styles of thinking might warp our compassionate ethics, as you were saying before. You know, if you get to the point where that style of thinking, um, you know, we could think up many different examples um, where unfounded beliefs sort of block compassionate and caring ethics. Those are sort of sensible checks. So I think that humility is important. We've just got to make sure it doesn't give people the excuse to fabricate things that might in themselves then become harmful. Yeah, um, yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, and I, I completely agree with that. But uh, yeah, not not but. Um, and uh, it also matters what your definition of evidence is, I think. Um, and it also, of course, matters what questions you ask, because the questions you ask define very, very, very much, very strongly the the answers that you get. Um, so it is being, it is, humility is really important, but so is um, being very aware of the questions that you're asking and the definition. Uh, and, you know, we come back to um, the question of sentience and sentientism. Um, the, you know, so, so the philosopher Lisa Atola has written really well about this in terms of um, we set a much higher bar for non-human life than we do for human life. And so the questions we ask and the evidence we seek in terms of determining our compassion or our ethical responses to the non-human world are outrageously difficult. You know, it's ridiculous, you know. Um, uh, you can and, see the bias in the conclusion because uh, of the way the story's been told. Yeah. Abs- absolutely, yeah. Uh, and so, if you and so and 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 I know we do that with other, you know, with other human uh, communities as well. But so it's really important to, I think, for me, is that I take a symbolic approach to life, um, and uh, grounded in the fact that stories. Uh, the power of stories and our values will shape our behavior more than facts or figures the majority of the time and being able to connect with people through the what um what the narrative institute call these deep narratives you know like our myths essentially our values our beliefs our behaviors um that's where we connect and that's what shapes our uh, moral or ethical behavior uh so i i'm I'm very much, uh, I'm always looking for, and again, this is my bias and I recognize that, you know, I'm looking for the symbolic um, and the imagistic uh, message of the way that we make sense of life. So I'm open to exploring what's real beyond the naturalistic, yeah. Yeah, makes sense, yeah. And I think w- when you talk about different types of evidence, I think it's deeply important because some people will hear the word evidence and think of, you know, randomised control trials and Cochrane review studies, and, and those are, you know, important types of evidence, but I don't think they're the only sorts of evidence. I think, you know, our personal experiences, our own perceptions are evidence too, and those of other people. I mean, we should be sceptical of them as we should be sceptical of all sources of evidence. You know, we're quite easy to convince and you know illusions can suck us in of course but they are types of evidence and we should lay them out too and i also like the point you made there because again there's a sense in a sort of scientific worldview that you know there is one reality that we all share and we can develop incontrovertible sets of facts and knowledge about it and I, and i do agree with that i do think we share a single universe and i do think that we can converge on you know sensibly set high credences and things that are true you know my coffee mug is here and I've got a high degree of credence that's the case but at the same time I think it needs to be part of a naturalistic understanding of the world that by definition each of us does have our own perspective on that universe and our reasoning is different our experiences are different our biology is slightly different you know hopefully there's enough in common that we can share and communicate and cooperate together but each of us just definitionally does have a different distinct perspective and Absolutely, I think that's yeah, another but... important part of this humility yeah um it is, and I think actually, sort of like while um, while taking uh, ayahuasca, which is as a it is a medicinal plant rather than it's not a drug, but it allows you know it gives you hallucin you know it gives you hallucinations, this hallucinogenic uh, stimulus with DMT. I literally I was laying there thinking, I'm just I'm just seeing the world as a praying mantis sees the world <laughs> with these sixteen different you know this this whole you know the 16 different cones in the eyes for seeing all of the different colors all of all of a sudden i was like yeah it's just what the it's just what the mantis sees you know um and we have to be very and we the 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 dog will smell and the uh, killer whale will socialize and the um 
spider will feel and the earthworm will experience uh, the planet in ways that we cannot. Um, and so our evidence is limited um, to what we can experience. Uh, and that I think is very, is humility um, to, to be, to hold on to that and to be aware of it. Yeah. And as we finish up on this first question, because that's been absolutely fascinating, my sense now, and, and I haven't experimented with Ayahuasca or, or any of the, um, you know, hallucinogenic um, stuff either, my boring classical naturalistic self will say that those experiences, while they feel radically life-changing, are all to do with the plasticity and the flexibility and the uh, amazing range of sentient experiences it's possible for the human mind to have, but they don't actually draw any bearing on the nature of external reality at all. Um, would you take the alternative? Because uh, other people will say, even if people who went into that experience with a very sort of hard edge naturalistic experience will sometimes go into that experience and come out and go, I have seen a totally different reality. I now understand reality itself in a radically different way. It wasn't just changing my mind. I now see something different. Where, where are you on that? Uh, well, I, well, what I'd say is that you're, you're right in that, um, but every experience we have is due to the flexibility and plasticity of our ability to experience it, you know, and it just so happens that um, we're conditioned uh, many, many times a day, every day for our entire lives to see and experience the world in the way that we do. Um, that's particularly true. Uh, for infants, you know, like the majority of your development uh, in your in your in terms of the the way that your brain uh, structures and, and neural networks develop uh, is is um, is shaped in that first you know uh, zero to seven you know of your life, and a lot of it in zero to three. Uh, and if you are if your parents are out of a tune with you, if you don't get the nurturing you need, you don't get the caregiving you need, then your brain. Um, you know, your brain re responds and shapes itself into the world in a particular way, you know? So for example, you know, the very basic thing being, do you see the world as a friendly or as an unfriendly place that is shaped very early on, uh, in your neural networks. Um, and so how I see the world now is shaped by the experience I had, uh, you know, um, as a child of whether I see the world as a friendly or unfriendly place. And I think what happens then when you take any, um, uh, medicine or drug that um, uh, gives you sort of a particular experience it's responding with your particular neural structure your your neural network uh, and just for me but that's that's exactly how um, that's exactly the way that our mind works and it one of the things it made me think of is it's an apocryphal story I know we could never prove or disprove it but you know the sense that when Christopher Columbus boats arrived in America, the indigenous communities didn't see the boats because they had nothing in their neural networks to recognize the boat. You know, that kind of story, that story speaks to me symbolically of the fact that we, we, we end up seeing what we believe we're going to see um, in the same way that we end up getting the evidence or the answers for the questions that we ask. So what i what i experienced through um the visions that ayahuasca uh um gave to me was an understanding of uh there are different ways to see the world different ways to see reality um and then what you do with that afterwards and how you integrate it actually probably just comes back to the experience of how you normally relate to the world but just to fit we know that meditation practices for example will change the neural network of your brain so that you experience the world in a different way in the same way that you know that doing the doing the, the taxi drivers london knowledge will change the hippocampus and memory so how we experience the world can change because of the experiences that we go through uh, and i think that means that the external reality does and can change de depending on the experiences that you go through yeah no, that's fascinating. Thank you. Well, let's let's come on to the second question. This, you know, what matters in the moral question. And you've talked already that you're drawn more to a, a sort of care ethics um, in terms of the way you think about, you know, what matters morally. Um, it'd be interesting again for you to sort of wind the clock back and tell us the story of how you came to that, um, because there's there's almost two questions when we talk, think about, you know, what matters and who matters. One is, 
you know, um, I guess the grounding of morality and ethics, what, what do good and bad even mean? You know, in the Catholic upbringing, it meant, you know, one thing, you know, here's the list of rules you have to comply with and God is a perfect instantiation of the good, for example. And then as you leave that, you know, something else has to take its place. So there's something about the grounding of morality, but there's also this critical question of moral scope um, in terms of, you know, okay, we grow up as young children, we care about our families. At some point we start to recognize that other beings, other people, maybe other non-humans matter and, and how does that journey play out as well? So yeah, again, you can wind the clock back as far as you like and sort of tell us how you got to where you are today on, on that front. Yeah, I think it's I think it's really interesting. I have a very, very clear memory um, of being in my 20s and having a conversation with a friend about this, this, the, the moral scope, the moral expansion of um of your uh or you know your 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 moral commitment to others beyond your family. Um, you know, and standard philosophical dilemma problems of you know you've got your family or you've got a random other set of people you know who would you save from the chop and and i was saying that i i at that point in my life i got to a point where i couldn't morally make the decision that i would that i would choose my family first um because um but i think you know there, there's so much i think wrapped up in the personal experience um of of us all of where we get to that many people don't, you know, don't um, accept, don't admit, don't recognise, don't, you know, understand their biases or how they've come to be framed by that. And I think perhaps because I've had a very, uh, uh, not not a deeply grounded um, upbringing in terms of family life, you know, my my family relationships are actually much less tightly bonded than than other people's family lives. You know, the family actually isn't a large part of my life just because of the way that that we that we grew up and um and how that has played out so it's so in, it's really interesting to me to look back and reflect upon that and say um it, it is it easier for example to expand your circle of compassion to others when the when they when actually you you haven't had an upbringing where you're so strongly bonded to a family unit and if you think back evolutionary it's really interesting you know you think back evolutionary uh into a evolutionary times of um you know what did that mean how did we evolve beyond the small tribal groups or, or social communities um i i really i've always thought of myself as a bit of a in the meerkat communities uh there is 95 percent of meerkats 99 percent of meerkats are incredibly tightly bonded and yet there is the one percent of the meerkat that's the maverick who doesn't have a family and who goes from troop to troop and plays an incredibly important role in the genetic variation of uh, of meerkat survival. Because you know, one of the worst things for any species is is a lack of genetic variation. Uh, it just it, it it it's you're writing your your death sentence without genetic variation. You know, your communities will collapse. Um, and so this one percent meerkat, this this random you know like trickster meerkat, goes and keeps that genetic variation as of the troops going. But the but the but the downside of that is that they don't have the family bonds. They're very much the loner, and actually, I you know, I mean, it's I mean, it's a terrible way to. I, I'm painting myself as a philanderer, and that's not. So, but but ethically, ethically, I'm a bit of a philanderer in that sense, you know, um, because I I've grown up in a way that has allowed me to to move much more easily away from any central commitment to a tight small family unit and i'm really interested in whether and what role that's played out in my own sort of you know development uh for thinking about my my morality and my ethics um um to be able to care more easily and more widely and, and extend that circle of compassion to others so um you know re reading it back like in a way I I grounded my um, uh, moral compass, my behaviours, my experiences outside of the family unit from a very early age, and took over in a way parental responsibility for myself from a very early age, perhaps six or seven, really. You know, not not inter like internal internal parental care rather than you know providing food on the table, or whatever. Um, uh, and and so I was asking those questions. Uh, from a very early age of uh, who deserve who who should I be morally responsible for or who's morally responsible for me 
uh, and my behaviours and my actions. And it sent me out into the world in a way to explore the world um, and to connect with the world in ways that freed me, freed me. And again, there's, there's positives and negatives to this, of course, but freed me up from um, a more traditional family upbringing uh, in in ways that perhaps other people haven't. So, and I think that really set me off into a question of uh, asking, you know, some of these questions about sort of like moral responsibility. And I wonder if there is something in that, in that, in that you can almost imagine there's like a compassion gradient. You know, I, some people don't like the idea of moral circles, but you know, sometimes it works, right? Where you have yourself and your immediate family around the centre, and then broadening circles of concern. And maybe if you've got a really rich, you know strong center you have a little bit less compassion to spread out whereas if that's less of a focus for you you can you can go broader i don't know if there's something in that or not but. yeah there is, like for me that's one of the ways that i have um narrated it to myself that's my story you know it's the way that i explain it to myself and but there is that that's in no way suggesting that people anyone who does have a really strong family tight upbringing has any less ability to be compassionate for others outside of that it's just a question that i um, ask of myself because it's my story. And you you talked a little bit about what I think of as a, maybe an intractable and seriously difficult challenge about prioritizing and you know inequality as well, right? So you're talking about my family member versus a stranger or the trolley problems and those types of challenges. And um, in a way, I find those types of challenges fascinating, sometimes extremely difficult. And depending on whether you follow a care ethic or deontology or utilitarianism or something else, right, you'll come up with lots of different answers. In a way, with this sentientism idea, partly because those problems are too difficult, I'm sort of trying to back away from them and say, look, let's leave that as a series of open questions that we can fight over and debate over. But for me, what's more important than the sort of gradient of our compassion extent is that is the boundary, is the scope itself. Because to my mind, and I, I you know, sometimes I'll talk about compassion for all sentient beings, but maybe a more technical term is moral consideration for all sentient beings. And what that moral consideration means for me. Isn't that, it isn't that I have to grant equal consideration to all sentient beings. It just means that they all have to matter in our moral calculus and in our moral system, whatever that system is. So as soon as something is outside of our moral consideration, that entity literally you know, does not matter. The suffering is irrelevant to us. Their death is irrelevant to us. They are you know, not in the moral calculus. We just do not consider them at all as we're working out what to do. Um, so that boundary for me seems to be the most important thing to get right, because once you're outside it, anything goes. Once you're inside it, at least you have a chance of being involved in the debate about what the right things to do are. So uh, and in a way, so this, this sentientism idea remains neutral on you know, priority, because we all prioritise, we have to prioritise, um, on whether we should be more egalitarian or whether we should recognise there might be gradings of different levels of importance but it says that every sentient being needs to be morally considered and, um, and also tries to stay neutral on the different ethical systems you can apply on top of that. So many people, when they think about sentience, will think of you know, Peter Singer and Richard Ryder and other people who followed quite a utilitarian approach or a consequentialist approach. And it's understandable because in a sense, you could think about the sentient experience that I'm having, you're having, the puppy at my feet is having as a consequence. So in a sense, it is saying we should care about that. But I think you can also, as long as your moral scope includes all sentient beings, you could have a deontological approach that would see all sentient beings as ends in themselves and maybe have some deontological rules that would talk about the way you treat all sentient beings. Uh, you can have a virtue ethic that talks about kindness to all sentient beings. You can have a care ethic that talks about care for all sentient beings. So you can sort of apply lots of different ethical systems. Sentientism is just standing at the back of that and saying, you have to at least grant moral consideration for every sentient, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, it does. I mean, it can make complete sense. And uh, I think it's a improve. It's definitely a an improvement upon what I understand as the utilitarian or consequentialist approaches, um, which uh, feel to me relatively inflexible because they uh, because there is. And I think for many of the the points you've, re you've raised, you know, they they bring you back to the gradient really quickly, actually. Um, and so, in a way, they are, you know, they're they're biased towards gradient questions, 
rather than be biased towards boundary questions, perhaps is a way of thinking about it. Um, so I definitely would, I definitely uh, would uh, approach things on the question of uh, toward, uh, towards boundary questions rather than gradient questions. Yes, um, my, it's just my my position is that an easy way to say it's like everything matters, everything matters, whether whether sentient or not. So if you are applying an animist ontology um, or a, or epistemology. Um, then uh, and thinking of as as some as enshrined in some sort of uh, legal systems around the world, you know the rights of nature, the rights of the, the mountain or the river, um, which we which I don't think either of us would would I, and I don't I'm not sure, but I don't think either of us would claim that they are sentient, um, but they matter. Uh, they matter very much, and so what I so. It, I think the importance of moving, I think you're right, the importance of moving away from gradient questions or systems of moral consideration or ethics or philosophy uh, towards questions of the boundary questions is the right direction to go in. My answer to that, though, is that there is never the, the completely defined boundary about what matters. In a way, you know, it's that, you know, the the, the story of if you measure the, if you measure the coast of uh, the UK, if you measure the coast of Scotland, you'll never be able to measure it all because it breaks down fractally every more and more and yeah, more. There is no right and answer. Yeah. There is no right answer. So the fir- the closer you get to the boundary, the more you see that the boundary isn't there for me. So I think it, it's in, so there's a couple of points here. It's like you practically, and this is why I say I'm vegan. It's like a vegan is um, like veganism is a boundary issue. It's, an, it's a boundary of issue of what's in and what's out of your your the decisions you make in life um if we had never uh gone through the industrial revolution if we had never or rather if we'd never civ- you know gone through the civilizational revolution if we, if all of the human life on this planet remained uh indigenous and uh connected to the planet living in a small communities if we'd never gone through the agricultural revolution that we had and we still lived in gatherer hunter groups there would be no vegan, you know, there would be no vegan because we, because veganism has been a, a boundaried response to a set of problems and moral questions that we needed to respond to, you know, our treatment of animals, the, the disconnection from the sacredness of life and the birthright and flourishing of all beings, you know, um, and, but particularly the, uh, the onset and the destructive, um, power of human supremacism you know so and that's it's interesting because I, I wonder if there might have been an alternative version of veganism that wasn't explicitly just a response to you know industrialization of agriculture and you know animal cruelty that's part of that but may have actually come from a different route one of empathy and identification with other sentient non-humans because if you look back at you know, ideas like Ahimsa and, you know, some really ancient ideas in Jainism and Buddhism and Hinduism and, and various different cultures that go back a long way, there was already a rich and direct sense of, you know, a compassion for non-humans as well as for humans and a sense of, you know, let's do no harm to them as well. So I, I, I wonder, actually, if even if we were in a, in a completely pre-industrialized state and if you like, everybody was indigenous, whether there still might have been a form of veganism where groups of people said, I can see the suffering when I shoot the antelope. You know, I have other alternatives. I'm going to choose not to do that based on wanting to reduce the suffering that's caused. Oh, oh absolutely. Yeah. The, the, uh, hims, uh, hims are is, is probably, you know, one of the best. I, I completely agree. There would have been, there would absolutely no doubt at all, because there was in Pythagorean times, you know, like uh, absolutely. Um, a respect and um, uh, much more compassionate and non-exploitative relationship to the non-human world. Yeah, absolutely. There would have been that. Um, I, gu- I guess I was just, the, my point being that I choose to be vegan now in this time, in this place, in this society, because it, uh, it defines a very clear boundary for me in how I behave and how I communicate. But then if you get down to the fine grain you know, the closer you get, the the the, the macro, the micro uh, approach to the individual moment. And one example would be, 
um, is that I went to do an interview for some work at a refugee center. It's a it's a garden. Um, it's a it's a it's an allotment center. It's like in an old primary school that they've turned into a refugee center for a safe space for refugees coming to this part of the the world um and so they grow the food you know it's a nice place for them to rehabilitate and get over the traumas that they've experienced as refugees and they grow and they and they cook the food and serve the food in the um in the kitchen for guests um and so i was there doing an interview and i was there over lunch so i said oh you must join us for lunch and i did and the food that was made for me was made by a libyan woman who had crossed the mediterranean in a dinghy you know who'd, who'd, who'd suffered incredible privation and and difficulty in getting here to a safe space and she's making me this food and, and i was very it was very fortunate that the the, the the lunch dish was a vegan dish it was falafels and whatever else but the dessert that she made was a milk dish and um this woman who has been through this incredible journey is is in front of me offering me this milk dish uh and in that moment do i do i do I stand by the macro boundary of my veganism or do I do I zoom right into the micro moment and look at the fact that that really right in that moment there is no boundary you know um it's the it's the choice that I make and my choice was to in that moment um take a spoonful of the dish as respect for her as a, an individual human being and the way that she but that was it I didn't take I didn't eat the whole thing I just took it and it, doesn't it doesn't mean i'm not living by my ethics it just means at some points your ethics are 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 a challenge not challenge is the wrong word um there are different demands on your ethical positions at different times i agree and i think this is um one of the other things i'm i try to do with this sentientist idea is recognizing moral you know, we have granting moral consideration to every sentient being doesn't mean there won't be circumstances where causing suffering or even death might be justified right there are situations even in human ethics where sometimes it's the right thing to do to kill another human right you can imagine some extreme situations where that's the case right so this isn't about some sort of perfect situation it's just about granting moral consideration in a meaningful way to every sentient individual in that context and it's yeah it's not about perfection it's about just doing what we can in an imperfect world to try to reduce suffering now in practical terms i think that does imply veganism because nearly all of us you know we have you know, the choice and the ability and the alternatives available to take those choices in our lives, not to fund a system that we know causes great harm. But again, in extremists, in different situations, you know, even the definition of veganism has where practical and possible, right? It recognizes that there's not some sort of perfect moral purity we're trying to we're trying to attain here. We're just trying to do better and try trying to do what we can. Um, so and and as you came to that stance of um, you know, you clearly do take non-human animal. Uh, ethics seriously was that a difficult journey for you how early did that happen for you and i'd love to come back to the you know the ecocentric or the more animist view in a minute um, but just to wind the clock back again when did, how did you work through the animal ethics yeah for me it started around uh in my teenage years where i first went vegetarian and that was very much very much through emotional rather than any rational connection you know as you probably would as a teenager to and it's always been uh, it was initially a response to um whaling actually i re- i was i got inv- interested in the stories of whaling um and just felt a deep wrong um with the with the practice and that led me to want to boycott all um animal products um and not knowing anything about veganism that's why i began it led then to it, coming to an understanding of the non of a uh, moral consideration for non-human life. I think uh, was seeded in childhood through companion animal um, uh, relationships within families, um, but didn't really come back to again until uh, through uh, through an environmental and climate route. Actually, so I was working for a charity that used media um, for development ends and i'm one of the projects we worked on was a big climate change project um and i recognized at that point that that my personal behavior of flying between africa and norway and the uk and project managing this project was part of the problem i saw then and felt uh the division uh the dividing line between the human and the non-human world in a more it, it, it from an um almost at the geological level, you know, thinking about our place on this planet. So I came to the non-human 
my interest and my responsibility towards the non-human world was first of all through the recognition of the planetary uh our planet our responsibilities to the planet and then that was about the same time that social media was just starting off and actually the um exposure to imagery of animal activism so the save movement the vigils outside slaughterhouses and i was actually at a vigil outside a slaughterhouse just yesterday morning um seeing the cows go into slaughter up here in um just outside newcastle so i've i've, I've maintained that practice of bearing witness so a lot so and, and then that started what is what happened for me uh is that i then began a practice of bearing witness and i began exploring what bearing witness meant um that, and it resonated with me it's, it's very emotional it's very profound work as well the embodied encounter of of bearing witness and coming face to face with the animal and the animals who are on their way to death um is profoundly uh transformative and, and not easy um but it but bearing witness is actually at the center of my ethics in that it's an ethical practice it's there's a question and a really good one to ask of whether it can be a moral duty to bear witness but the other but and again but it, it really resonated with me uh, on my journey and my uh, uh work because obviously the the other side of bearing witness is testimony and being a writer uh, wanting to find um, useful and um, transformative uh, practices for my working life and the things I could do is uh, is providing testimony. You know, so taking the experiences of the billions of non-human animals who are exploited for absolutely no necessary purpose in human society, and um, communicating that work through testimony. So it, my my ethical practice is one of bearing witness, um, I, I think. And that's what matters to me uh, is that the, the suffering is witnessed and we bear testimony to it. Yeah. And, and by doing that directly yourself and then using your testimony, you're almost helping millions of others bear witness, at least by, you know, one step removed in a sense. So yeah yeah um yeah like you know just trying to bring it back to your question there of like you know what matters um um morally um i think the suffering of others matters a great deal a great deal and um the suffering of the other is um i got i've got i've got really interested in levinasian um ethics actually you know this question of the call of the other um and i um i think it's really there, there was nothing in levinas's work responding to questions of the non-human sentience nothing yeah. at all you know he's yeah. just yeah. Fa famous famously had nothing to say about animals you others know? can only be human <laughs> others yeah. yeah yeah apart from bobby the dog and apart from the snake it has a face so um but um uh but when but the but actually the the framework the model of levinasian ethics only really works if um if the non-human is included because levinas famously you know like the call of the other cannot be determined by who the other is otherwise you are already making a decision in advance of who you are going to respond to the ethical call must always already be responded to and so if the ethical call is coming from a pig in a slaughter truck you respond to that call um and i and, and for me that really speaks to me of um of what matters it's the call of the other in pain and suffering um can you help can you ask what are you going through can you ask how can i help and it doesn't matter who is asking that and i guess coming back to you know you, you, the, the the philosophy and the the moral questions that you're asking around sentientism um the sentient can make that call yeah whether that be a fly, a worm, a pig, a human being, the sentient can make that call. Therefore, we are duty bound, ethically duty bound to respond to that call. My, I guess, where then you look at the, the question of boundaries, where you draw that boundary, is that um, can a mountain, can a river make that call? Um, and, and this comes back actually to where we started from in terms of symbolic, symbolic thinking. 
when you know if i don't know if you saw george monbiot's um, piece of work recently the the, the documentary riverside put together by spanner it's brilliant franny franny armstrong spanner productions george monbiot fronting it essentially what they were doing was expressing that the rivers the rivers in the uk and they they were based on the river Y as they as, as where they were um broadcasting from the river is making a call you know for our ethical response um but we're interpreting it. You know, the the river doesn't have the voice. But that's that's the importance of our symbolic um, understanding of the world. Yeah, I, I agree, and I and I love the way you put that. You know, the, the suffering of the other and their call to us, and you know, our obligation to to care and respond. And I think again, it's one of my frustrations with philosophy generally is that so much of even the most brilliant philosophers just have this innate assumption that only humans matter. And then they do, then they go to work, right? With these amazing theories and philosophies and so on. And as Levinas did, right? Even with his own words, wasn't able to break through that social norm to recognize the implications for non-human sentience. So I find that frustrating, but, um, but I like the way you put that because to my mind, the next question, as you said, is to say, okay, who can be an other? Right. And and that is, again, where I'd apply sentience as a as a criterion, because I'd say any being that has a perspective, that has the capacity to suffer or flourish, that has the capacity to have interests or needs or, you know, or wants, you know, is one of the other. And therefore, the moral obligation flows. And personally, I would draw the you know, I think there's a fuzzy boundary there and we should just follow the science to try and work it out right? because we're trying to understand earthworms, sea sponges, bivalves. You know where's the boundary, um, but I would draw that. I would say you know you can you can only be another if you actually have a perspective of your own and and interests of your own. But others would push that further and say you know a plant or a tree or a rock or a river or the planet and the ecosystem themselves can be another themselves. In a way, I don't I don't necessarily mind if people want to grant moral consideration beyond sentient as long as every sentient being gets serious moral consideration because part of my frustration with i guess the center of gravity of the modern environmental movement is it seems to have jumped to this very generous ecocentric compassion you know we're not worried about ecocide and ecosystems and rocks and rivers but most of the people have still carved out the vast majority of beings that are actually capable of suffering from their moral consideration so you know the average person is much more ready to grant rights to a river than they are to grant rights to a pig in a factory farm um, so in a sense, I don't mind people going beyond, but let's at least not forget the sentient beings. And I think if someone does want to grant moral consideration to rocks and trees and rivers and plants and ecosystems, I'm sort of I, I don't mind if you want to do that. But there is something distinctly different about the capacity to suffer for me. And that means even if you do intrinsically care about a plant, there's still a difference between cutting a carrot and cutting a pig because of that capacity to suffer that even then puts sentience on sort of another notch higher um and it just feels to me like a lot of the modern environmental concern is really just an, another you know it's a veneer on another anthropocentric view we care about the ecosystem and the climate because of its threat to us as humans um yeah and because we enjoy it aesthetically we like looking at our nature programs but do we really actually intrinsically care about you know the sentient beings in the wild or the sentient beings in our farms you know not so much pass me a bacon sandwich uh, so I, again, another another sort of rant, but that's my concern about going too far. Because in a sense, if if you get to the point where you say everything matters, there's a danger that implies nothing matters. If you see what I mean, it's almost like and and, and the you know the Twitter version of it. As a vegan on Twitter, you'll know this is when people talk to you about well, plants suffer, so you're a hypocrite. That's not a serious challenge, but it's a it's a sort of silly version of this more holistic challenge. I completely I I, I understand what you're saying. I completely get what you're saying. I mean I. I, I I personally don't agree with the idea that if, if the, the the idea that everything matters risks nothing mattering. I, but 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 that's because I don't believe it. Do you know what yeah, I mean? I, I mean I, you, you don't. You know, yeah. Yeah. So, but I but I understand how it can be used as an argument to avoid, as you said, you know, this great. And you're absolutely right. You know, this. I, you know, being at COP twenty six, you know, and seeing the great the great and the good of the environmental. NGO world, you know, all of these wonderful people working for the planet, rocking up and and buying the most climate intensive meat dishes for lunch, you know, yeah, it's and incredible, isn't not, 
not give not giving a toss about the animal who is being eaten and not actually even giving a toss about the climate footprint of the food you know which is just unbelievable but you're you're so you're absolutely right there's been this huge bifurcation this incredibly devastating and detrimental division between the environmental movement and the animal movement those people who recognize the sentience and suffering of all beings and those who are thinking of the at the ecological scale of the planet and the and the mountains and the rivers and the ecosystems and healing that healing that rift um is the uh, is is part of the work that we have to do right now i think absolutely in your book pig and thin air yeah yeah that was the starting point for that and, and more work that we're trying to do um around um th- th- and that was at the heart of animal rebellion as well you know sort of shifting really putting pressure on the environmental groups to advocate for plant-based food systems and getting in animal you know uh, care and ethics of care for animal animals who are being exploited in a way through the back door into these environmental groups um who are terrified and scared because uh, mostly because they were still practicing sort of really exploitative you know uh, practices over suffering beings and i think that is when it comes down to it that's a lot of it you know a lot of you know it's it's really it, it uh, i i would never use the argument as a strategy of saying you can't be an environmentalist if you're eating meat because i just don't think it's useful but it's but it's that that's at the heart of the problem yeah it is at the heart of the problem so i i completely agree with the problem that you're um tackling uh in that there's an awful lot of um uh ignorance and willful ignorance of the suffering of a great number of sentient beings non-human animals in the planet on the planet as we as we speak right now and I think that you this this approach is about sort of it's an additional approach. It's like bringing those it's bringing those animals into um, constant conscious moral consideration. Yeah, I think so, and and that mitigates the risk that people say, you know, we are just humans. We should have humility. We're just part of a monstrously complex, rich set of systems and ecosystems and cycles as the antelope consumes the lion, we can consume my bacon sandwich. And, you know, it's all part of the circle of life and let's respect the system. And, and, and I think what you do, what you did there is exactly right, which is say you can think holistically, but we have to bring forward the beings that are capable of suffering and recognize that matters too. And that's a sort of check. Um, something we can bring to the fore in that debate too. And obviously your works help to do that. And, and I, that brings us nicely onto this final question, which is how can we, make a better future because again you've touched on some of the themes here about the importance of narrative about our moral scope but you've already started to talk about um how there are these different you know themes of change we want to drive you know we've got so much to do still even within the human species in terms of ethics and discrimination and poverty and disease and all of the usual challenges we've then got the challenges of uh, non non human sentient animals you know farmed wild um uh and the environmental and the ecological and the climate crisis as well so we've got these different themes of challenges in a sense i you know i retain an optimism partly because i think there's some really obvious win-win wins between those agendas so even people with divergent agendas can still agree on a common way forward and naively it seems that quite often the technical answers aren't necessarily that hard i either i mean of course we need some more innovation we need ideas we need creativity but often through these conversations the central challenge seems to be one of human psychology and therefore political will to actually make stuff happen so so in that context and this is you know fascinating given the work you've done you know filmmaking writing campaigning thinking about you know transitions with the grow green and the um, planting value reports and so on it's too big a question to ask but how do you think about driving positive change and um the levers we can pull on all of those fronts yeah you know what the, the thing is well actually is that um l- l- and this is no criticism of you and what you just said there because i understand what you just said i let's get let's get away from the idea that it's too big a question because it is the right question to ask it's the right question to ask so right that's it this is what we're doing this is what we need to do and fine and we can do it and so actually i i've 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 had some really interesting just opportunities to uh brainstorm for want of a better word with 
uh, colleagues of mine working in this space, you know, so, um, and I'll name, you know, I'll name check them if it's okay, but people like Mia McDonald at Brighter Green, the Think Action Tank in America, Kim Stallwood, um, the, um, you know, long previous guest, yeah, and long-term, you know, advocate for animals, uh, Martin Rowe, um, secretary of the Culture Animals Foundation and publisher, um, publisher of my book. Um, so, you know, we've been having conversations about, okay, it's a big question, but what what's our response? And so let's have some big responses. And so some of the ideas that we've been working on are a multi-year, um, very big, ambitious project to focusing on narrative and com- communications. This is our and creativity. This is our slice of the work. You know, so you've got over there the Good Food Institute and all of the cellular agriculture people. You've got the you've got the um, uh, you know, the the animal aids and the vivas and the animal qualities, you know, doing their work. And, and you've got veganuary. You've got, and this is, so this is our slice of it. What we've, been, what we've been thinking about and some stuff that I've been working on is we need to really understand what are the most effective messages, narratives, stories, deep narratives, the way that we can, you know, uh, the, 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 the question, the, the messages that are going to resonate. We've got to think about, okay, then how do we build capacity within the movements animal movement climate movement but also outside of the movement so in the common sense conversations you have with friends over dinner or you know in the pub um and then how do we build a bigger infrastructure to carry and amplify those messages and that means you know evolving the media and communications landscape and actually a lot of that started to happen with like the alternative media people like you know byline byline news um navarro the canary uh, sentient media plant-based news you know like the you know ad- adopting and now really maturing use of social media new media platforms um but uh, all, all with the caveat of that we we've only been, we've been doing this less for less long and not as well invested as the right wing um big agriculture big oil you know uh, climate denying fossil fuel organizations have been doing for decades you know i mean we know you know the institute of economic affairs the original think tank started by a battery chicken farmer to keep politicians out of his battery farm business you know so the animal animal you know exploitative animal agriculture and right wing think tanks media domination of the communication sphere have been hand in hand for decades the money and the power and the momentum they built up and the skill as well and you can it's fa- yeah because it, and it's fascinating you can see these lessons being replayed from the tobacco industry to the fossil fuel industry to the animal agriculture and you know often it's the same pr firms the same lawyers the same you know warping of science it's fascinating and depressing yeah yeah it is but it's also like it's a it's a challenge it's a it's a um what's the word it's a um the gauntlet is there and we've been slapped with it many many times (laughs) and actually the way so for us for me the way to respond to that is actually okay this is this is where we're going we're like let's let's do a deep deep but you know um, urgent dive into the narratives that are going to shift us and what works let's do a really sort of max maximizing the capacity building in the environmental and animal movements to um so we're all working with better messages and better narratives and let's actually take that fight out into the out into the narrative infrastructure out into the communication sphere let's start to control and lead um the the ways that the common sense conversation is shaped in the ways that we have deferred for far too long to the the greater powers and money on the on the right wing and the in in big ag and big um big sort of like fossil so for me that's that's what that's what i'm doing well that's what i'm hoping to do and looking to do creativity is a large part of that you know coming back to this symbolic thinking you know what makes a good myth you know what makes a good story um and so the work that we're doing is like this isn't just it's not just you know an advocacy group with a better message it's like it's it's poets it's writers it's theater it's um journalists it's all anyone who is connected and grounded in storytelling you know um uh, in in the me- in the greater media sphere but also in the common sense everyday conversations that we have um it's seeding it's having congregations you know it's uh, there's a great book by alex evans who was um, did a lot of work in the united nations sustainable development goals and his book the myth gap 
um, references, you know, ideas of the congregational spaces where these conversations and myths can be spoken about and and really get into us and, and challenge our values. Um, so it, it's that kind of work I think that we that I'm doing anyway, and I think that um, we need more and more people to do. I agree. I agree. I mean, the, I sometimes get a little frustrated about this focus on stories and narratives because. I guess just intuitively, my bias is, look, can't we just tell people the facts and then that will be obvious and the answer is and we can move on? And frankly, that's just breathtakingly naive given the reality of human psychology. Right? And, 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 it, and it doesn't mean the stories and the narratives have to be fictional or wishful thinking. Right? They can be grounded in a, a, an ethical stance. They can be grounded in reality. But we have to find narratives and stories that hook people, that compel people, that drive people, that, that that help them engage and understand and change their behavior. You, you can't just, you know, send someone an email with the answer and expect them to just go, yep, fine. <laughs> I follow your logic, right? Just not how humans work. No, absolutely. It's grounded. It's deeply grounded in psychology and the cognitive psychology, cognitive linguistics. Um, you know, there's brilliant work that we can draw upon there. Um, I, I mean, I, I was also getting very frustrated with you. I, all I heard for the last three, four, five years was this idea, oh, we need a new story. We need a new story. I'm like, well, what? Someone tell me what, you know, and, and what actually people are driving towards is that we need, we need common sense conversations that change people's values, that shift people's values. And that will come in all, I don't believe there's one meta narrative that's going to, you know, win them all. That's a bit sort of like, it's a bit like, yeah, it's a bit like sort of Sauron and the and the one ring, you know, like it's if if there if that comes about, it's just it's not the right approach. Um, but there will be the right the right narrative in the right context at the right time. Um the, the uh, and and to, and that are ready to use at the moment of crisis, like the next pandemic, for example, which will probably be worse than the one that we've just gone through. You know, that's you know. Uh, because of the way the world is working, we've got to have these. These we've got to have the um, understanding of how to use narrative effectively to shift enough public opinion at the right time so that a system change occurs. Um, you know that, and that's what that's the work that I think we need to do. It's deeply important. One of the things I take some encouragement from also is the nature of you know what, what is that narrative talking about and. This is probably oversimplistic, but it does seem like in many of these areas we've shifted from a, a sort of doom mongering, you know, climate change is bad, we are threatened, animal agriculture is ethically and, catas- and environmentally catastrophic, it's bad, right? A statement of something is being bad, and let's tell stories about how these, these things are bad, to one which is more about, you know, what do we do next? And the solutions and how do we transition? And I find a lot of encouragement in that because, again, it's the sort of analog of the vegan on Twitter moment where someone says, but if everyone went vegan, there would just be chickens and cows running all around the streets. And you're like, okay, that's, a, that's one, it's a pretty silly thing to say. But at the same time, it shows that there's a latent, you know, people are starting to accept that you might actually be right, that these things are bad. And what the hell are we going to do? The work you've done with the Vegan Society around the Grow Green Report and the the planting value story which again is saying look we, we're going to do these important things to resolve this bad stuff right and here here it is right here's a plan we're going to lay it out and here are the steps and here's the timeline and here here's how we're going to have a just transition that's going to help the communities involved work through these things and so i, I take some encouragement from the fact that it feels like the narrative shifting a little bit more into how are we actually practically going to do this stuff and it's a bit less just putting the putting the alarms up no, it's really important. And the the I mean, to be honest, my favorite part of that whole report for the Vegan Society was the were the narratives that the the framing narratives at the beginning and the end of the of the store of the farmer and the chickpea, the the vision of the vision of what a farmer will be doing in the year 2030, which is which was plant-based, which was rotational, which was huge amount of investment in sort of training and um, education and research, you know, so all of those things. And to actually ground that in a narrative a story that someone you know like to frame the whole report first of all through some sort of creative work and actually and that's not just me making it up so a lot of my academic work has been about studying the 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 environmental texts of the past 60 years that have been effective so um one of my pieces of academic work was to um really analyze the writing of rachel carson obviously who wrote silent spring and her 
the trilogy of um, uh, sea and ocean books that she wrote before that. And so I explored the affective template of Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. And, you know, it's all very famously um, framed by this fable of tomorrow, which is the first chapter of Silent Spring, which outlines exactly what will happen if action isn't taken to ban these pesticides. Uh, and that fabulistic, like what you were saying earlier about, you know, the stories that we, um, the stories that we make up don't have to be fictional. Uh, it was a fable grounded in the, the, the very rigorous science. You know, she was a, Rachel Carson was a, was a, a marine biologist and everything that was in that fable was accurate scientifically that she had then made literary so that it could emotionally affect someone. And actually, when I talk about narratives, in many ways, that's what I'm talking about. You know, like, how do we use the literary and rhetorical skills that we have to affect people to tell the story of what is real? You know, so that's the kind of work that I enjoy doing. Um, and, um, and that's the kind of work that I think will really affect people. Yeah, deeply important. Thank you. Well, I've taken up an enormous chunk of your time. I could talk to you for hours, but um, it's been a genuine pleasure. We've answered what's real, what matters, and how to make a better future in 90 minutes. So it's not bad going. Is, is there anything else you'd like to lay, lay into the conversation before we... Oh, you know what? I, I, did, just, I did just have a thought um, then. But no, you, you're right. You know, this question about... Oh, yeah, that's what it was. This question about the vision of the future is deeply important. And I've, it's been coming up. Uh, a couple of conferences it's, it's come up three or four times over the last few years um and when someone said it i remember dinesh wadiwell the great sort of marxist sort of um academic over in sydney university saying it at a conference in terms of yeah we, we, we've we've got enough of what we don't want we need to see what we do want and martin rowe martin rowe in america like his vegan america project you know visualizing you know the kind of future that we can have um there's some great work done in theology uh, actually of, of all places thinking about the way that prophets of the past have helped communities through transitions of crisis and there are three elements of what those prophets do i'm not saying that i'm a prophet by any you know stretch of the imagination but uh, as a storyteller i i really like the learning is that the prophets have identified what's wrong and and spoken the truth spoken the reality and not denied reality. And that's crucial for accepting where we're at. And then the second part is then creating systems of structures and narratives of spaces, congregational spaces to help people through that space. And then the third part is the vision of what comes next. And, um, and I think that more and more and more people are coming out um, to embody these roles. So you think of Jem Bendel and the deep adaptation um, philosophy and movement, for example, um, you know, thinking about telling the reality of how it is, providing spaces for grief and processing, and then presenting the the the, pre the presenting a picture of a different future. Um, and I think um, you know, in the literary world, Hillary St. John Mandel's Station Eleven is a novel that does that, which is why it's been so successful. And I think actually the 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 the, the pieces of artwork or um, the pieces of advocacy or the philosophical movements that are now the ones that we need and actually are the ones that are being successful are the ones that combine these three roles. That's a beautiful way of putting it. And I think with that, because without that vision of the future and also a view of how to actually realistically get there, I mean, they're not just practically useful because there's work we need to do. They, I think they have a deep impact on the way people respond to the latent threat as well. Because if there's a threat without the promise of a, a way forward, you go to denial, you go to fatalism, you know, and, and neither of those are going to help anybody. So I think in, in a way that that sort of vision of the future and the plan is centrally important to helping people respond intelligently to, you know, the, the threats we are all facing. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, that's brilliant. Thank you. Well, that's a great way to wrap up. And hopefully that, you know, I don't know if you share my sort of latent conditional optimism that we are going to be able to drive some of these changes through. I mean, if you look back and changes like these always felt too slow for the people who are pushing them, but when you look back, they can happen remarkably quickly. So let's, let's see. I, th I think maybe it's um, when you, when you're active and when you're doing something like you are with this podcast and the sentient um, idea and that I am with my writing, 
uh, you, you chat it, it, it's the it's the channel into which any despair that arises flows. So I think act, taking action, doing work, doing something is really really important for that. Yeah, yeah, completely agree. Completely agree. Well, thank you. It's been an absolute inspiration talking to you and getting to know you a little bit. What's what's the best way of people following you, uh, learning more about your work, buying your books? Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I'm most active on Twitter, I guess, as, and that's just Alex Lockwood. Um, the, the other social media I try to avoid, really. Um, but yeah, I'm there uh, on my website, alexlockwood.co.uk. Um, my the main animal book is The Pig in Thin Air, published by Lantern Books. So you can get that online. Um, I've written a novel um, about environmental disaster, which is called The Chernobyl Privileges. Um, and I'd and, and for anyone interested in more the more technical or sort of deep, deeply analytical, geeky stuff, um, the report that I just did for the Vegan Society is at the URL www.plantingvalueinfood.org um, about the policy and the framing we need to move us towards a plant based food system. Brilliant. And I would recommend that to any vegan on Twitter who's asked, what are we going to do with all the chickens running around the streets to say, well, you know, we've already got a plan. Just, you know, <laughs> here we go. <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much, Alex. I'll let you get on with the rest of your day. It's been a genuine pleasure. Yeah. Stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you.